Hello, and welcome back to Eric Likes Animals. I'm Eric Mahan. Thank you guys so much for listening. Today's species is one that I am so excited to talk about today, namely because I actually currently work with one, and that is the Cape Porcupine. Cape Porcupine are also referred to as South African Porcupine or African Crested Porcupine. And as those names kind of give away, these guys are found in Central and South Africa. Normally in savannas, forests, or really anywhere where there's vegetation, these guys are pretty versatile. Now, Cape Porcupine can live upwards of 12 to 18 years. They can weigh upwards of 20 to 65 pounds and are a long length of a 1.5 feet to 3 feet in length, making them about the size of a medium-sized dog. And at that size and at that length, these guys are actually considered the largest porcupine in the world. There are about 23 species of porcupine around the world, and they're broken up into New World and Old World porcupine. Old World and New World are split up, well, for one, location, but number two is quills and body type. So, first off, body type. Old World porcupines, they're normally on the ground. They're kind of stockier and stay down low and not the best of climbers. New World porcupines are actually very good climbers. For example, North American porcupine and prehensile tail porcupine, another two that I've worked with, are very good climbers. Prehensile tail is a little better than North American, and, well, one feature that helps them out a little bit is, well, having a prehensile tail. It acts kind of like an extra arm as they climb through the treetops in South America. The other feature that separates New World and Old World porcupine is, of course, the quills. Old World porcupines normally have much larger, showier quills, whereas New World porcupine have smaller quills. But what New Worlds have that Old Worlds don't is barbs at the end of their quills. So Old Worlds are very painful when they go in, and New World porcupine quills are very painful when they come back out. The word porcupine actually in Latin is quill pig. And even though they have kind of pig-like looks and qualities to them, the Cape porcupine, all porcupine species are rodents. Rodents are the largest order in the mammal group with a wide variety of sizes, shapes, and diets. Some rodents are actually carnivores. Not all of them eat plants. Now, the main feature that makes them a rodent because, well, (laughs) sure isn't their diet, is the upper and lower incisors. Now, one feature about those kind of big buck teeth incisors is they never stop growing, which means they have to constantly gnaw on things like bark, wood, bones, whatever, to stop their teeth from overgrowing their mouth, which would prevent them from eating in the first place. Rodent teeth are also known to be harder than lead, aluminum, copper, and iron, which is why some rats seem to get everywhere because these guys can literally chew through concrete. The other feature about rodent teeth a lot of people notice right away is that orange or yellowness to the teeth. And the yellow and more orange these teeth are, actually the healthier they are. These guys didn't skip brushing their teeth and that's why they look so bad. That is actually an enamel that helps harden that front portion of the teeth. But the back doesn't have it. And the reason for that is it actually helps keep the teeth nice and sharp. Because what will happen is as they're gnawing, that front portion of their tooth wears down slower than their back portion, which kind of creates a chisel-like method, which means that their teeth are always perfectly sharpened to cut into whatever they're going after. Going back to the other features of the Cape Porcupine, Like I said, these guys do kind of have some pig-like features to them. I mean, a little bit. They are short, stocky, and long like a pig. But that's pretty much where I say it stops. Except maybe their cute little nose, which kind of does have a little pig-like quality to it as well. Cape porcupine have whiskers, tiny eyes, and tiny ears, which are perfect for digging. Speaking of digging, these guys also have very good digging claws, which is extremely helpful if they need to dig out a shelter or going after some of their favorite foods. Cape porcupine, for the most part, are herbivores, 
Their favorite things to eat a lot of times are roots, so they need good digging paws to get down and get all those delicious roots underneath the plants for them, which is really good for them since sometimes where they live, there's dry season, so the actual plants that are up top really don't have a lot of nutrients to them, but their roots underneath still have a lot of good minerals and vitamins and even sometimes a little bit of water which is very helpful in those drier areas. Other features about them are, of course, the big quills. Now, I don't like to share folklore too often, but when I was doing research on the Cape porcupine, I did stumble upon a African folklore about how Cape porcupine got their quills. And honestly, I thought it was a pretty interesting story. So why don't we read it? Long ago, Porcupine was a most handsome creature, and he possessed a luxurious coat of fur. As he looked so splendid and many of the other animals often complimented him, Porcupine became quite vain. One day, while Porcupine was talking to Jackal, he boasted that if all the other animals were as beautiful as he was, then the world would be an altogether much nicer place. This vain remark annoyed the Jackal and so he plotted to spoil Porcupine's beauty once and for all. Several days later, Porcupine just happened to meet Jackal again. Listen, Porcupine, said Jackal, pretending to be kind. In that thorn thicket beyond the water hole lives a powerful shaman medicine man that can give you a look even more beautiful than you do now. Go over and seek his help. But you should leave your handsome coat of fur here with me so that it will not get spoiled. The porcupine fell for the jackal's clever ploy. He took off his much-admired coat and left it in the jackal's care. After thanking jackal for his thoughtfulness, porcupine started to make his way toward the patch of thorns. Silly porcupine reached the thorny patch and had only pushed himself in a short distance before he was badly pricked all over by huge spikes. Try as he might, he could move no further forward. He had to haul himself out backwards. This was extremely painful, and most of the thorns actually broke off when he could not pull them out. Aha! laughed the cunning jackal. As you could never get your lovely coat all over all those ugly spines, I shall wear it myself. And jackal ran off, laughing all the way. Today we see that jackal wears a handsome coat of thick fur, whereas the dim-witted porcupine hides away during the day. He only comes out after dark because all the other animals mock him, remembering how boastful porcupine was about his good looks. And that is the story of how Cape Porcupine got their quills. So don't worry, that is not actually how it happened. But I thought it was a fun story, and actually does have some facts in it. For one... Pokey, and the only other one is that porcupines are nocturnal. Sometimes you'll see them out in the day, but for the most part, Cape porcupine are a nocturnal species, which is pretty impressive since most of Africa's top predators come out at night. But when you have basically a butt full of quills, predators don't normally scare you as much. There's actually been a couple videos out there where You have a group of tourists that are filming a pride of lions and they just killed a gazelle or wildebeest or something and they're just sitting down to eat and they're really tearing into it. And along comes bold, stubborn porcupine that is just trying to get from A to B. And unlike other animals that would normally walk around the lion pride viciously ripping into another animal, porcupine don't have time for that. So it walks straight through the pride, and actually the lions are the ones to jump away because they probably have either been taught or have experience about getting quilled in the face. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, why doesn't the porcupine shoot their quills out before it even gets to the lions? Because that is a question that I get asked all the time when I'm working with porcupine. And the truth is, I'm sorry to just say, cartoons lie to you. A porcupine's not going to sneeze and quills are going to go flying across the room. A porcupine can't pop a balloon across the street. All porcupine quills are 
is hardened hair. And you can't shoot your hair out, or at least most of us don't feel like we can shoot our hair out. But these guys, it's just hardened hair. That's all quills are, which means just like hair, they shed out, they grow new ones, the whole thing. The big difference, of course, being hard, yeah. The other thing that they are able to do is disconnect fairly quickly. So what what they do is if a animal hits or they hit them with the quill still attached to them, the quill will pop off of them and stay in the animal that it got. So it can be a little bit painful depending on how many quills, but a little bit of pain here. Yeah, it's way better than losing your life to a lion or hyena or whoever. Because even though they can defend against a lot of predators, doesn't mean it always works. Hyenas, pythons, and birds of prey will especially go after younger baby porcupine. But um, every once in a while, a hyena might get lucky and flip over a porcupine and actually be able to eat it. Because the underbelly of most porcupines aren't very spiky. Because obviously, they they can't have spikes everywhere, that'd be pretty dangerous for them as well. But in any case, say a lion does come upon a porcupine, what does the porcupine do before that happens? Well, number one is, let me tell you, porcupine are very stinky. (laughs) Um, I love them. They have great personalities, but porcupine in general are very stinky. So if you're a lion and you've been quilled by a porcupine, you will probably remember that smell pretty good, and you're probably going to veer off before you even see it. But say it's a young lion and it's, well, never actually run into a cave porcupine before. And it keeps on coming forward thinking that it's going to get a free meal. When it comes in view of the cave porcupine, the cave porcupine will start to puff up. Like I said, the crest goes up. Its back end might start puffing up a little bit. But the main feature that will happen first is that its tail will start to shake. Because on its tail, it has these specialized quills that sound like a rattlesnake. It makes that little ch-ch-ch-ch. So that is just a warning sign. Hey, back off. They will also sometimes stomp and grunt as well. And sometimes they'll even do little fake charges at the animal, which if you're a lion, most things don't charge at you. So that would definitely throw you off like, ooh, maybe I shouldn't mess with this if he's not scared of me as a lion. But if that still doesn't work and the lion needs to learn its lesson, Next step is the porcupine will puff off its back end and basically become a giant pokey peacock. (laughs) So uh, they have these longer 20-inch quills that kind of make them look a lot bigger, which, you know, if all of a sudden an animal grew three times, that would definitely freak you out. The outer quills are still very sharp and still hurt going in, but they're not as painful as those inner ones when the lion still doesn't get it then the porcupine will actually start to run backwards at the lion because most of their quills are on the back. Their front portion is a little bit softer, doesn't have really any any big impressive quills because, well, having big impressive quills right next to your face could be pretty dangerous. So for the cape porcupine, they're all in the back, and if they need to, they will run backwards to try and hit the lion with them. And normally the lion will run away because that's pretty freaky, or they get quilled in the face and learn never to go after a porcupine again. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, all right, but what if the porcupine has an itch with all those quills? And that is probably the second biggest question I get besides, hey, how to go work in an area with a porcupine without getting hit from across the room. The next one is, okay, but how does a porcupine deal with an itch on its butt with all those big quills? And actually, kind of just like you think, very carefully. So besides those claws being really good for digging, they're really good for actually getting scratches in between the quills that keep their kind of softer pads away from the sharp ends because, yeah, porcupines can technically quill themselves. For the most part, they don't normally quill themselves. What happens is they will quill each other from battling for territories or, yeah, breeding. But besides the claws, they also will use their teeth, are able to get a little further into their mess of quills without getting their face into kind of the danger zone. So those are kind of the main features of how they can keep themselves clean and, well, take care of any itches. 
they can quill each other. And for the most part, a lot of times what will happen is that will happen during breeding slash male battles. So what will happen is when two males are trying to fight over a territory or say they're trying to fight over a female, the first thing is they'll make a lot of grunts, they'll whine, and then they'll normally battle it out. They'll charge at each other. They'll try and kind of whack each other with their quills until eventually there's a victor. When the victor wins, he'll whine and stomp his tail to impress the lady. And if she seems interested in him, he will do the most logical thing possible and spray her with urine. Yeah, if that's what you're into. Anyway, so he sprays her with urine and that's to let her know to lift her tail. Because, well, her tail is covered in a lot of very big, very sharp quills. Once she finally lifts her tail, he is able to safely breed with her without getting stabbed a thousand times. Also, they normally have a pretty u- unique position as well, where he kind of sits back a little further because, yeah, he's he's literally trying to breed with a sharp cactus. Uh, it, it pretty much is as uh, goofy and uncomfortable looking as uh, you you're imagining right now. So these guys are monogamous, which means that they kind of mate for life. A lot of times porcupine are solitary or small families or in these groups of two. And of course, then they defend their territories. Gestation for Cape porcupine are about 90 to 110 days. And they can have upwards of one to four babies. And a baby porcupine, by the way, is called a porcupet. So these guys can have one to four porcupets. And yes, I know where you're thinking, don't worry, the quills don't harden until after birth. So she doesn't have to have the additional pain of having to give birth to quilly porcupines on top of everything else. Like I said, they'll harden after about a week. During that time, baby porcupets are pretty fragile and parents normally don't want to move them too much and they definitely will guard them fiercely. They guard them pretty fiercely until they hit sexual maturity, but especially during that time until they their little quills have hardened up because during that time period, that's the perfect time for lions, hyenas, pythons, birds of prey, anybody to pick them off while they aren't going to get a face full of quills. It takes about 8 to 18 months until Cape Porcupine hits sexual maturity. And once that happens, the lovey-dovey parent stuff is over and they pretty much kick them to the curve. They now have to figure out life on their own. Number one is dealing with predators. What are they going to do now that they don't have another set of eyes on the back of their head? The main one, making sure they have a bunch of shelters set up around their region. And if there aren't shelters available, that's where those good digging claws, small eyes, and shorter ears come into play. Those big powerful claws can dig out nice big holes and those eyes and ears are perfectly designed to not get too much dirt in when they're digging. Now, They don't always have to worry just about lions and hyenas and pythons and birds of prey. Obviously, humans are a major factor as well. Luckily, however, under the IUCN Red List, they are considered least concerned, which means they have a very good, stable population. Doesn't mean it's going to last forever, but at the current time, they're doing very well. Cape porcupine, in terms of human conflicts, they have to deal, of course, with what everybody else is dealing with, habitat loss and global climate change, but they also have to deal with a couple others. Number one, they're considered a pest species. They eat people's crops, and that normally leads to them being killed off just to protect crops. The other main thing is they are hunted as well, which, yeah, seems a little weird, but they are a food source, and also their quills are very sought after. Quills are being considered a good luck ornament as well as the shaky quills. Like I said, in the uh, the first thing that they'll do is they'll shake those specialized quills to warn a lion, don't step any closer. Well, some people will turn those into musical instruments. Which all seems a little weird once you remember that quills just fall out naturally, that you would kill a porcupine for something that would just simply drop off. But that is the issues we face. And that is why one of the major conservation, besides setting aside a bunch of land, is educating people how not to kill the porcupine, how to find the quills, and how to deal with porcupine as a pest with their crops. How to make sure that they don't feel the need to kill the porcupine 
just to save their livelihood because we want to make sure that the porcupine stays around for a while because these guys are one interesting species. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the Cape Porcupine. As always, you can listen to me on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and now Good Pods. So that's a new one that I just updated this past week. So now you can listen to me there as well. Also, make sure to check out Facebook and Twitter where I post all kinds of fun stuff, especially on Twitter. I love to retweet fun conservation and cool animal pictures and all that sort of stuff. But until next time, See ya.